Christy and I decided I should try simple slideshows. And that would be great if I didn't have to go through about three or four drafts <laughs> to just think. Now, Revelation, as you know, is a really simple book. I don't know why I'm having this too much trouble. That is a little bit facetious. Um, and this is a sermon I do wish I could have made a slideshow because there's just some things I wish I could visually show you. But I do trust that maybe if you write some, some references down that I state or you look at your outline, you'll follow along. Um, I do ask you to stand in honor uh, of hearing the word of the Lord one last time if you're able to stand. And we're going to try to tackle all of Revelation 4 today. So if you're able to stand, thank you. If not, uh, nobody will write your name down for detention or anything like that. Revelation 4 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones. And on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and around the throne, were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, and worship him who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Let's pray. Father, we're basically let in on a worship service in heaven. And for those of us who have never been to heaven, it might be kind of hard to understand at first. Uh, Father, as we also try to tackle this ancient text written in an ancient genre that we don't always understand, it's hard for us. So give us patience, give us the right heart, give us a humble heart to receive your word. Say what it is that you are desiring to say, simply because things are hard in the Bible, and especially simply because people argue over what it means, it does not mean we should neglect your word means we should be humble and in listening, trusting the truth that the Holy Spirit is a present teacher and guide as we listen to these words you penned long ago through your Holy Spirit given to John. Say what it is that you desire and get me out of the way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, please be seated. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider, says Isaiah. Or, or Jeremiah, he writes... No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times, and the turtle dove, the swift, and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. Creation knows something. Creation knows something. Creation knows its creator. 
Paul personifies creation in the book of Romans and he says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Creation knows something. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork day unto day. Utter speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. All of creation. It's amazing. We know it. We should know it. You know, Paul sees creation as evidence for God. He says in Romans 1.19, What may be known of God is manifest in men, for, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, if you see creation, you should know there's a creator. <laughs> You're without excuse, is what Paul is saying. Creation glorifies God. There is a consistent everyday worship service happening 24-7. Creation is in on it. It reminds me when Jesus descends the Mount of Olive, Olives and his disciples were worshiping him and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And I wonder if Jesus was meaning that a little bit more literally than we let on. But back to the contrast that Isaiah and Jeremiah noted. These creatures follow me, glorify me, but, well, my people don't, says God. Jesus, God in the flesh, incarnates, that's a fancy word that means became flesh, carne, meat, <laughs> incarnates. And he comes and he's God and the book we're reading makes that abundantly clear. If you just if you don't believe it, read Revelation 1 again. We'll read Revelation 5 next week. But Christ comes and like creation, Christ obeys God. Like creation, Christ doesn't know his time. Remember, the, the, the creation waits. It's, we don't know when it will, redemption will happen. Well, Christ... Excuse me, I should say he does know his time or his hour. That's what the book of John says, the same author of Revelation, that Jesus has self-awareness. It was not yet his hour, meaning not yet time for him to die for the sins of the world. But then he does die. And he establishes the church. We think about Matthew 16 where Peter confesses Jesus stating, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, where in turn Jesus says, On this rock I will build my church, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Some say the rock is Peter. Others say the rock is the profession that Peter had, Christ as Lord and Savior, the Son of the living God. I think it's latter. But the point is, by Acts chapter 1, the church has grown to 120 people. By Acts 2, it's grown to 3,000. Revelation could have been written and delivered in the 60s or the 90s A.D., so anywhere from 30 to 60 years after Pentecost, after that 3,000 number. But then what have we been reading in Revelation 2 to 3? Letters to seven churches. Seven contemporary churches and the writer, the evangelist John, his time, John, close disciple of Jesus. And save only two churches... There has been devastating news. Only two churches got no, you know, you're doing good. Case closed. All the other ones is, you stink. <laughs> there has been the reality that the, the ransomed new covenant people of Christ are still working from a spirit of religion and fear, not relationship and grace. The new covenant people of Christ have been lured and tempted by false teachers, some of them on the promise of sexually sinning, not unlike today with the compromised church who gives in to the culture. 
There have been churches, new covenant people of Christ, who professed what Peter professed, who, who saw and received the grace of Christ, who nevertheless go about their days somehow in lukewarmness. A place where Christ has said he'd rather just vomit them out if you're not going to be hot about it. You know, I heard the news last week, maybe some of you did, of, of something that sadly it's not altogether uncommon anymore. There was something a little bit uncommon about it. And I felt like that this pastor was one of the good ones. Well-known pastor. Not as well-known as we might think of TV preachers. But nevertheless, a guy I did listen to here and there and, and I read from and I liked. Well, he approached his elders at his church... And the stuff I've been reading has been very vague about the circumstances. Nevertheless, he confessed to having an inappropriate relationship with a woman. The guy is like 72. The, um, had a wife, has a wife and kids. The church decided to immediately let him go while he repents, hopefully. And a few friends of mine and I, we were just understandably sad because this just wasn't one of those give me more money so I can be rich pastors. Uh, this was not a flashy, ritzy, all about the ratings sort of pastor. He was just a verse by verse, gospel proclaiming, Jesus centered preacher, in my estimation. But we're all sinners. And I wonder if, if John came to the end of this round of seven churches, again, five wherein Christ proclaimed he's about to shut their doors, to think like Paul thought in Galatians I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ. To a different gospel. You know, it could be saddening. It could be devastating. For John to know Jesus personally. But to, to see this sense of betrayal on behalf of his people. Uh, perhaps some Christians today identify in the national sense of believing that only 50 or, or so years ago. At least in the U.S. If not more widely the Western world. We're not going to say it's perfect many cases it was wildly hypocritical. Nevertheless, there, was, seems to be, there seemed to have been a more positive, affirming sense of allegiance to Christ in the world. And so it can be saddening to see not only where the world, but where some of the Christ-professing world is now damaged and turning away. Romans 4.10 says the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying you are worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created Christ deserves more than we give him Christ deserves more than lukewarmness Christ deserves more than fractured allegiance. He deserves more than double-minded trust. He is worthy, the elders say. You think about that. Worthy, weighty, befitting, do, suitable. It's only suitable. I think about Romans 12, 1, where Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren... By the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. I'm not there yet. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's only reasonable to do this. It's only reasonable to worship him as a living sacrifice. He's worthy to receive glory, honor, power. Why? For he created all things goes back to what Paul was saying. He's the creator. We should know better. Not only is he creator, but by his will they exist. He's sustaining it. You're breathing today because God lets you. John in Revelation 4, I think he's about to find a healing balm. <clears throat> after having to relay some of the bad news that he's had to relay to the seven churches. Take, for instance, this well-known pastor who botched it. Whenever things like that happen... Besides sadness, I think some get angry, some feel betrayed, some lament that Christ's name is being disgraced. I mean, I was reading an article, and you know what you should never do whenever you read articles online? Read the comment section. Don't read that at all. <laughs> of course, there were some non-believers out there, okay, moving on, this, this guy is this week. 
They believe the church is just full of these people because maybe it is. And for a commentator, and a commentator for the book of Revelation, I think he states it well for John. That commentator says, unless we take frequent glimpses into glory, the imperfections of the church in this world will discourage us. Christ's glory, the glory of God's kingdom is what we live for. I'm just going to state, I probably should have stated even further up front, but I think the reason this sermon is hard for me is because some of you have already heard, there's a lot of Christianese biblical statements, God's glory, the weight of glory, God's holiness. And all these things, I think, for me, is like I'm still so blind. I'm so blind to seeing the value in this. And maybe that's what Revelation is for. There's value in just worshiping God. The only way I can liken it... We're living for God's kingdom, or the perfect kingdom is what we live for. And so, if you aren't anticipating his kingdom, listen to this. If you aren't anticipating his kingdom, then I believe you're literally losing hope. Quantitatively, you're losing hope. Any of you ever look forward to Christmas as a kid? Or maybe going over to a relative's house who lived far away, and so you savored the time with them. Or you looked forward to vacation, or you looked forward to returning to fall for the school sports, or whatever made you anticipate things as a kid. What made that anticipation heightened and worth it was then the actual experiencing it. You knew it was coming, and it came, and wow, it was closure. I looked forward to the holiday season this coming year because I looked forward and enjoyed it last year. And so John, I believe, is healed, uh, perhaps massaged for him to have to have been the bearer of bad news. Right. Oh, look, what's what's the last disciple going to say to us? Jesus says, you guys stink. He's going to throw you up. (laughs) Thanks, John. (laughs) Now Christ invites John into a real community of faith, doing church as they ought to. Back in verse 1. After this I looked, and there in heaven a door stood open. These are common terms used in prophecy. All of it. It's establishing that John is encountering and experiencing the same sorts of phenomena that Old Testament prophets did. Now, after this, referring to Revelation 2 and 3, I looked, and to quote a prophet like Ezekiel, who said that so often in his letters, from vision to vision, I looked, and this happened. I looked, and that happened. I put all the references in your outlines as to where Ezekiel said that. And in fact, some homework, go home and read Ezekiel 1, and you'll probably be amazed at how much Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4 are alike. In heaven, a door stood open. So this text says, Ezekiel starts his book stating, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Peter, when he gets the revelation about Gentiles being included into his church, he saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth, Acts 10, 11. So John is having a similar experience, a prophetic encounter with God. Still other places we could turn to see similar languages when Moses goes up to God on Mount Sinai in places like Exodus 19 verse 3 or verse 20. <clears throat> Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 that he knows someone, and many would say that that's Paul referring to himself, but he knows someone who would receive revelations from God by being transported to heaven. So John, according to Revelation 1, <clears throat> is a prophet experiencing all of this on Patmos. And after his first vision, he's receiving the second one. And he reminds his readers of his setting when he says, and the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet. So this is a reference back to Revelation 1.10. John is saying the very same voice that spoke to me back in Revelation 1. Now he's saying this time, come up here and I will show you What must take place after this? And then John says, at once I was in the Spirit. And that's again, same language from Revelation 1.10. He was in the Spirit there too. So I hope this is easy enough to follow so long. 
so far. John is being invited <clears throat> to view basically his second vision. It's just like any other prophet in the Bible. He's being invited by the same voice who came to him first of all in Revelation 1. Why is he being invited to heaven? I think it goes back to what I opened with. He's about to witness a real worship service. I mean, to put it a little tersely, it's like God saying, Let's, I'm going to show you how the big boys do it <laughs> up here. He's about to see pure praise of God. He's about to understand that, that even if the church on earth is fragile and frail and in need of, of, of repenting, and if their vision is partial and broken and blocked, the throne of heaven is filled with pure, unadulterated praise of God. <coughs> I saw this clip from another pastor a while back, <clears throat> and, he, and I think he said it well. And I don't mean to step on toes, but it stepped on my toes, so it might step on your toes. He said, <clears throat> this pastor said, you ever hear phrases like, I really didn't like worship today? He says, and it hit me, that is one of the stupidest sentences you could ever say. <laughs> I, I didn't really like the worship he said, think about that. Did it ever occur to you we weren't worshiping you? <laughs> did it ever occur to you that we don't care? That in your own mind, did you think, man, what is worship? And, and God, isn't he the one we're trying to please? End quote. What if the churches aren't about the hymns? What if the churches aren't about the choruses? or the, the new songs, or the old songs, or the translations used, even the sermon, or the prayers, what if instead you and I sought to make Christ, Him, and Him alone the center of our worship? The object of our worship. I mean, all this stuff we just talked about as far as our participation, and we're going to try to keep giving our hardest and give it our best, but it's not for you and it's not for me, it's for Him. And so for John, it would be easy to be discouraged. It would be easy to maybe feel either disappointment in the churches or sadness or embarrassment. But Christ invites John into what pure worship is. And the first thing he shows him is the object of worship. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. It's a Jewish way of saying God. Jews had plenty of creative ways of saying God without saying God. <laughs> Didn't name him outright, but if there's a throne in heaven and if one's sitting on it, you know who it is. <clears throat> and before we unpack the scene in verses 3 through the beginning of 6, by way of reminder, we talked about this. Revelation is written in what's called an apocalyptic style. It's named as such because it was a well-known genre of literature that people in the time of Jesus and even before read and enjoyed. And apocalyptic literature, like any literature, has features and rules. And I summarized a lot of the features in a phrase called dust to stars. Uh, apocalyptic literature portrays earthy, real events or things in cosmic, epic, supernatural terms. It's symbols. Uh, later on in the next chapter, you're going to hear that Jesus is a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. Is he really? No. But hopefully we get the imagery. He's a sacrificial lamb. That's what lamb means. He's got seven eyes. Seven means perfect eyes. He sees all. Horns are a symbol of power. Seven horns. He's all powerful. So John is not saying Jesus is literally a disfigured, weird looking lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. No, he's, he's giving you, he's communicating to you through symbolism who Jesus is. Why did it do that? Well, it's apocalyptic literature. Go ask the originators of that genre. Don't ask me. So that's actually what's happening here at the throne room. This is what John sees, but he communicates it with symbolism. Look at verse 3. He who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. I know all of you got this right away. We'll move on. No, just kidding. <laughs> If you, don't know your, if you don't know your Old Testament, don't be ashamed because I didn't recall this fine detail myself until I studied. The breastplate of the high priests that they wore. The high priest <clears throat> was very much a high official at the temple in Old Testament worship. And we read in Exodus 28.15, You shall make the breastplate of judgment, judgment, 
And then verse down in 17, you shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of stones. The four rows shall be a sardius. That's the first row of stones. That's the starting row. And then let's go down to the last row and note the final gem in verse 20. And the fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. The point being is that John says, He who sits on the throne had the appearance of two stones, which is the first and last stones on the breastplate of what? Judgment. The one who occupies the throne is one of judgment, of justice. That's the point. But then verse 3 continues that there was a rainbow around the throne in an appearance like an emerald. Hopefully you know the rainbow. Rainbow is the story, the first story you learn, and which that's kind of scary. I'm going to teach you a story, kids, about how all the animals and all the people died. <laughs> but the rainbow comes from that story of the flood. Genesis 9, 11 through 13 says God sets a bow in the sky as a reminder that he'll never again destroy the earth in a flood. It's the sign of mercy. So the throne is where judgment and mercy resides. There's justice and judgment to be had those who are unrepentant in the church. I will close your door. I will spit you out. But there will also be mercy for the repentant and the humble. That's who occupies the throne. Verse 4 says, around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. Hopefully you see that this is just brimming with symbols of governance and authority. You got thrones, you got crowns, white robes, as it did in the seven letters. It symbolizes purity and righteousness, the robes that Christ gives to those who trust in him for salvation. So those who are ruling and reigning with authority, but they also have the righteousness of Christ. That number 24 has multiple interpretations just like anything else in this chapter. Um, some will look to First Chronicles 24 and they say, hey, there were 24 orders of priests serving at the Old Testament temple. So here they are in the heavenly worship at the new temple. Well, the way I lean is that 24 is two twelves together. And there were 12 heads of the tribes of Israel and there were 12 apostles. And I think this is a way of saying that God's chosen people throughout the entire story of the Bible, throughout all of redemptive history, they're there ruling with and worshiping God. That's the way I view it. Um, Kevin, will I go to hell if I don't agree with you? Absolutely not. <laughs> and, verse 5, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices that should remind us of Mount Sinai. Another place where another prophet went up to meet with God. Exodus 19.16 talks about lightnings and thunderings. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. That's like the original tabernacle. Exodus 37 verse 23 tells you that. Only here in Revelation, John explains that the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne are the seven spirits of God. And you're like, I knew all about the seven spirits of God, Kevin. <laughs> that phrase showed up in Revelation 1.5 as a description of Jesus. Some would look to Isaiah 11 verse 2, which I won't quote for you, but it does list seven characteristics of God. But also, seven means what? Perfect, Perfect completion. So... Another way to look at it is, what are, we, what are we seeing about Jesus? He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's also the spirit of spirits. <laughs> Seven spirits of God. In other words, he's the top, best, perfect spirit. So let's regroup, because I know you all are tracking, and half of you, there's drool coming out of your mouth. Wake up. John is brought up to heaven. He sees the throne, God, where justice and mercy meet. All of the saints, all of the faithful, or it could be another group of people, they're all ruling and worship, ruling with and worshiping him. He is the fulfillment. He is the reality of Mount Sinai where there was also thunders and lightning. He is where the presence of God is. And he's the temple where there were seven flaming torches. He is the spirit of spirits. Verse 6. 
Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. Talking about Mount Sinai and back then, in Exodus 24, beginning with verse 9, we read, Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. It was also glass. Other translations will just say glass as well. So in other words, I think John wants his readers to know he's in the exact same place. (laughs) He is where Moses was. He's before the presence of God. He's standing where Moses did. And moving on, now that the throne or the object of worship is described, God, the throne, John's going to go on to describing the worshipers, those who worship God. And it's going to be for John, I think, this contrast, this contrast where where some of the seven churches that, that Christ had dictated letters to to have faulty worship, hypocritical worship, broken or lukewarm worship, John is now going to see real worship. And it's interesting to me that the, let me see here, I've lost my place already. (laughs) It's interesting to me that the, the 24 elders were encircled about the throne, but the first thing that John will see giving worship is creation. You would think that, oh, he mentioned the 24 elders, and now he's going to talk about how they worship him. No, John looks to creation first. But it's depicted in a symbolic way, because that's the book of Revelation, and it apparently needs to be symbolic all the time. So we pick it up in the middle of verse 6. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures. Now, this is an easy symbol. Hopefully, I'm just going to see if you're catching on. Full of eyes in front and back. What would that symbol mean, I wonder? They see everything. They're all seeing. <clears throat> and it, as one of my commentators states, the more clearly we see God's plan, the more we will worship him. I don't know if we fully grasp this, but the point is this, and we'll come to, actually we'll come back to this in verse 8, but really take a look as you go home. Take a look throughout the week, and I think you'll find... There's always reason to worship God. There's always reason to thank God, to praise God. Christy and I try to do this with the boys at every evening at dinner. What are you thankful for today? God's providence brings you lots of things, whether you acknowledge it or not. He's to thank for the roofs over your head. He's to thank for the food you eat, for the friends, for the family, for the provisions, cars, jobs, all of it. And if you're looking, you'll always have something to be thankful for. Just have open eyes. Verse 7, the first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. Some translations say ox here. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. So this is, again, like many prophetic visions the Bible records. And I think we're seeing shades of both Ezekiel 110 and 118 as well as Isaiah 6, 2 and 3, with the appearance of heavenly creatures. Some of it is verbatim. And all of these symbolic faces, these creatures, uh, to me, it just reinforces to me that John is before the same throne that many prophets have been before. He's been in the same place that Ezekiel and Isaiah have stood. And I think the best way to interpret these faces is that these creatures are considered... The noblest, the strongest, the wisest, and the swiftest in creation. Lion, very noble, royalty. And if the word is ox instead of calf, you think about workload or strength. Human beings are the wisest, they're the most resourceful. And the eagle uh, for swiftness and speed. I think for Americans, we might think of, you know, kings of the food chains, and we might think of bear, wolf, mountain lion, and moose. I don't know. Just, you know, the biggest creatures, the best creatures. But the idea is, is that all of creation, these are representatives of all of creation, all the creatures that God has made. Verse 8, the four living creatures, each having six wings, it means they're swift and they go fast wherever they need to go to, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest 
day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Man, we should sing songs that say those words. (laughs) All of God's creation is worshiping him. They extol him. Four is often a symbolic number used in the Bible to, to refer to everywhere geographically. The four corners of the earth, the four winds. So the four creatures are representatives of all creation and the noblest and strongest and wisest and swiftest of creation. They worship God day and night. This goes back to, to all seeing. Day and night means there's always a reason to worship God. One of my commentators, the one I mentioned before, he says there is a beauty in every season, a majesty in every location, a wonder in every species of animal. I know this is hard to believe, but did you realize that during COVID, when nothing made sense, worshiping God made sense? In the 2020 election or however the 2024 election shakes out, whatever kind of America we have next year, whatever kind of wars happen, do you know that there's always a reason and a season to worship God? Earlier this year, we did a series called Find Us Faithful, and I made this point in one of the sermons that this fellowship has been up and worshiping God through World War I and the Depression, World War II, and communist regime wars, and 9-11 and COVID. There's always a reason. There's always every day a season, day and night, without ceasing to declare, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So it goes back to what I started with. Creation knows something here. Creation, it is creation that's, that's worshiping. You know, some of my friends on Facebook, I, I see things all the time. Why dogs are man's best friends. And it's really self-serving. I have dogs. I love dogs. I'm allergic to cats. So this is, this is coming from a dog lover. <laughs> but all the reasons why a dog is a man's best friend, they're all very self-serving. Why? Because my dog will be loyal to the end. No matter what. They're always happy to see me. They're always by my side. They never have a reason to be angry with me. Things like that, because they're brainless. <laughs> and they can't fight back even if they wanted to. So you're saying, I could be a complete jerk to them, and they'll love me anyways. I can't do that to another human being. I wonder why. <laughs> but it's still humbling when God points out, like I started with, hey, these animals know what to do. These animals carry out their orders. All of creation is waiting patiently for redemption, but but here we are, mindless, disobedient humanity. Look, the sovereign creator and sustainer of the universe, he died for my own sins, and I think I'll disobey, ignore him, and do what I want. Right? That's the problem. Dogs are, are brainless, as I just said, but they do a better job at following God's will, it seems like. I could learn something. Humanity ought to learn something, and they did. And and we end with what we already covered. Verses 9 through 11 finishes. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him, who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for You created all things, and by Your will they exist and were created. I think about this picture. It's hard for me to wrap my head around. All of creation. All of of the animals before the Lord. All of humanity. As Paul writes, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This image of heavenly worship. I believe it's God's way of saying, this is the praise, do him. This is the worship, do him. And I believe it's a healing balm for John. He's written to the half-hearted worshipers around his time. Now, now here's the worship, do God. And it's both an ideal to strive towards, but I also think it's a sight in of itself to behold. The holiness and the grandeur and the worthiness of God. I want to finish with a story. And this was all the way from draft one of this message. So I'm glad I got to use it. (laughs) Because I was hung up. Because here we go. 
Woohoo, go me. I got all the, the symbols interpreted. Maybe we have a clearer picture. John's being led into heaven for a pure worship service. How convicting. My dog is a better worshiper than me. So what? So I, I kind of made mention that John can see the contrast between the faulty and tainted worship of blood-brought Christians and the true worship in heaven. But still, so what? And I mentioned before, did you have a, a place you liked as a kid? I, I mentioned anticipating Christmas. I loved every school year from about mm, September when it started to January. And by mid-January, I was ready for summer vacation again. <laughs> and I guess, I didn't know it then, but in retrospect, I realized I think school was hard for me. The environment was, was hard. I wasn't abused or anything like that. It was just taxing. Maybe it's because I'm just an introvert and seven hours of being with people was hard. I don't know. Maybe it was just spiritually detecting that, 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 so, that same sort of warmth and love and stuff that I felt at home or church didn't exist as much at church, uh, school. And whatever it was, about this time of year, fall heading into winter, I remember I loved coming home from school, smelling chilly or something when I entered the house, getting into PJs far too early, getting some hot cocoa and watching some old 1980s holiday cartoon specials my dad had recorded years ago for the, from the VCR. And that often did the trick. I felt a whole lot better. Did it directly con confront any voiced or logically written down problems as to why the environment at school burdened me? No. Did it speak or verbalize anything to me to make me feel better? No. All it was was environment. I don't know how edifying Garfield yelling about candy at Halloween is. But it was the environment. It was almost spiritual, if you will, that raised my spirits. So on a much greater level, we see that John is invited to view the throne of God. And I believe that raises his spirits. Kevin, can you lay that out for me logically and mathematically in words? I just tried, but I think experientially is where people will understand the beauty and the application and the point of Revelation 4. Being in the presence of God, adoring Him, praising Him, it's healing for the soul. The environment of God is where joy is restored. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I personally, for me, it just seems to be echoed in my mind, a favorite verse of mine, Psalm 1611, to being in the presence of God and experiencing the fullness of joy at your right hands are pleasures forevermore. And Father, that's what I believe is Revelation 4 is. Yes, you're going to lay out some more things that are going to happen that John's going to have to talk about. But the first thing is you just invite him into your presence. The first thing is... Uh, John, you're witness to a lot of churches whose worship is faulty, it's hypocritical, it's sickening me. Let me show you what real worship is. Let me show you the praise and worship due to me. So, Father, we pray that we would have that spirit and truth of worshiping you, of, of adoring you, that we would have the obedience that the animals seem to so well exemplify, that wherever you tell us to go, we go. Whatever you tell us to do, we do. And Father, we thank you that you uh, also give us white robes, meaning that you forgive us of our sins and you give us your righteousness, both as a means of saying we are righteous before God, but also the power to be righteous like you are righteous. So Father, we thank you. We ask that we would take this truth with us as we go. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. <clears throat> Get me.